Hey, good morning, everyone. This is Stephen Nagy. I'm joined with Shauna Decker today. Mr. Chris Noggle is somewhere else in the world. He's over in New <laughs> Zealand. So it's uh, like three in the morning over there, three, four in the morning. I don't know. It's it's craziness. So it's uh, it kind of really makes you think, though, when you travel like that across the globe, just how massive things are, how different things are. Um, different ways that people look at the news, look at money, look at finance, look at investing, look at life. And so today's going to be kind of a special episode. We're going to get into the news. Um, I was traveling last week. I was in Lake Tahoe, disconnected, didn't really look at my phone, didn't really look at my computer at all. So missed a lot was going on. And guess what? It was wonderful. It was absolutely <laughs> joyful to not think about any of the craziness that goes on every single day. But what we're going to do is we're going to catch up today. I mean, we're going to go through the news, kind of catch up what's gone on over the last week. The Federal Reserve has a meeting today. So Jerome Powell will come out and talk about some guidance moving forward, what we're expecting, rate heights, rate cuts. Those seem to really drive the markets these days and drive investor sentiment and everything else. And since we're joined with Shauna Decker, we're going to get some unique perspectives and ideas because... You know, Sean and myself have lived much different lives, different places in the United States, different mindsets. And it's always interesting to me to see how that kind of, you know, goes into how people think. So I want to get a lot of um, interaction with, with everyone watching today. So I want to hear your opinion. So we're going to talk about some of this stuff. And please chat in the comments, chat in the chat box over there. Like, what do you think? And we're going to read that on air. And I don't know if it makes sense. We'll bring you over and we'll put you on video if anybody's up for it. So let us know. But um, we're going to get this thing kicked off. I'll put this quick little video. We'll be back in 27 seconds. All right, here we go, and we are back. So with that said, again, my name is Stephen Nagy. This is What the F Happened, and this is our weekly show. We do every single Wednesday, 9.30 a.m. Eastern, where we talk about the week in review, what's going on with the news, what's going on with different policy decisions, what's going on with the Federal Reserve, what's going on with the markets that's driving your money. Since Chris Noggle's traveling is over in New Zealand right now with some of our other team, um, they're kind of getting away uh, meet with some of the executives and one of the insurance companies we do business with and having a great time. Um, the show must go on. So myself and Shauna are here today. So what's going on, Shauna? What's new? I don't know. Just hanging out just like you. I'm excited to be here. Normally on Wednesdays, I am the viewer of this show and this is where I get my news from. So, I mean, I'm going to be a lot more reactive, I guess, uh, in real time because normally I'm listening to it and keeping my opinions to myself, but I guess I'll let them out. Yeah. Yeah, well, thanks. <laughs> thanks for being brave. So if you guys don't know Shauna, um, Shauna's been with Chris, uh, working with Chris longer Seven than and a half years. I have. I mean, okay. you know, for many years now, she's gone from when they had Flip Out Academy and the real estate to money school and money multiplier and PMC and everything else and really controls the show behind the scenes, you know, does all the work that nobody else gets to kind of realize happens behind the scenes. And obviously, you guys see Chris uh, primarily, myself on videos, things like that. But Sean is one that makes all the magic come to life. So it's really cool that she said, you know what? I'm going to step it up today. I love watching the show. I'm going to hop on and I'll share some opinions. But it does fit perfectly for what we want to talk about. So if anybody in the chat box, though, has seen any good stories this week, anything you'd like us to bring up and discuss, you know, put it over in the chat box. We'll pull it up and we'll talk about it. But with that said, Sean, what I wanted to kind of start off with was, you know, how do people consume news and how does the news influence your mindset and ultimately your life? And does it really affect you or, or things that you do in life? And because, you know, when we look at the news, it's a very powerful uh, industry, I guess, so to say. And, and you know, if we look back to different presidential elections and, and, you know, everything that's come out over the last couple of years on how, you know, some of these social media sites, 
like Facebook and, and kind of have colluded with the federal government and these major mainstream media organizations to suppress stories and really angle the news in a certain light to make things look better or worse or, you know, whatever narrative they want to drive. So it does have a lot of impact in our lives. And so it really boils down to like, are people still consuming their news from, you know, places like CNN, NBC nightly news, you know, are they going to social media, things like Twitter or X, um, Facebook, Instagram, like, where are you consuming news? So I'm just curious, like anybody that's watching right now, if you don't mind putting in the chat box, like where do you get news from? You know, and I'll start out, you know, I, I you know, I've been in kind of the, I don't know what you want to call it, self-help financial <laughs> independence industry for ever since I left my job as a financial advisor with Ameriprise Financial back in 2006. And one of the things I learned when I was transitioning away from the corporate world, the world of traditional investing to the entrepreneurial world um, of real estate investors and business owners, you know, one thing that I really learned in that transition was mindset makes a big difference. And, and one of my first mentors I ever had used to always talk about how the news is so negative. And this was... 15, 16, 17 years ago, I think before we all kind of started to realize that the news is very propagandist, that they're very tilted. They, they, you know, you know, everybody like just use um, traditional examples. Fox News usually sways very far right. You know, places like MSNBC and CNN usually, you know, face really far to the left um, side of this political spectrum. But even outside of politics, one of my mentors first taught me, he used to say, you know what CNN stands for? Constantly negative news. And so before the news even got overly political like it is today, it's always been one of those things where it's just negative, 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 negative. I mean, you turn on like even your local news at nighttime and I'll do this maybe once every few months. Like we'll be eating dinner. I'll just happen to turn the TV on for a second. And like the nightly news will be on or the local news will be on. And it's like, I can't watch it for more than like 60 seconds because it's like within those 60 seconds, it's like two people died over here. This teacher raped this kid. Like these people are abusing these animals. It's just like all this negativity. So when I was, you know, transitioning to entrepreneurship as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, as an investor, you really have to drive yourself. You know, you don't have a boss. You don't have somebody waking up every day telling you what to do. You don't have a plan of action. It's you. You're setting that action plan. You're setting that, that those goals for the day and you're making yourself do it. So that's one of the reasons why a lot of you know entrepreneurs fail is because not everybody is able to do that on their own. But one of the things that drives people to be able to do that is keeping the right mindset. And positivity is a huge aspect of that, in my opinion. And so, you know, they say, you know, CNN constantly negative news and you start looking at it in that light. It's like 100 percent true and accurate. But then the question becomes, why? You know, why is it all negativity? Why don't we focus on the positive? And, and you know, it's like goes back to those old sayings like, why do we always want to watch a, a car wreck? Or, you know, if you go online, you start like watching these videos, like people like getting murdered and stuff. It's like, you almost can't stop watching. You know, it's one of those things. So is it built into our psychology as humans? Is it our nature? I don't know, but it seems to sell. And I think that's why these news organizations, why these companies focus on the negative, because I think it sells. I mean, it's all about the money. And, and again, another thing we hear all the time, follow the money, follow the money, follow the money. And how true is that, though, when you start looking into stuff? If you really want to know the truth, follow the money, like what's driving it. So, you know, I learned many years ago, just turn the news off. And that was great for a while. Just turn the news off. Like, don't even pay attention to it. But then, you know, as you get a little bit older, you start to have a family, you, you know, start to get, you know, grow businesses and, and start having employees and realizing like what you do every day affects so many other people and what goes on in the world affects not only your life, but your family, the people you love and everything that goes on. It gets to a point where you're like, well, I got to kind of follow the news. Like I almost have to know what's going on. So, you know, Shauna, when you said, you know, I, I don't watch the news, like I come on this show to watch it, to kind of learn what's going on real quickly each week. 
speak. It's true. I mean, so many people now are going to things like podcasts. They're going to things like these 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 formats on on X and on social media. Um, you know, a, a great example, Tucker, Tucker Carlson of Fox News, you know, now streams his show on X constantly. And it's it's interesting because he has now free reign. He's not controlled by the Fox News organization. He can go talk about it, do and, and whatever he wants to do as a journalist. And we've seen this happen now with so many different journalists now over the last several years that have gone independent to do their own thing. And it's definitely catching on. I mean, Personally, you know, I, I, I listen to a couple different podcasts pretty regularly. So if I'm doing things around the house, um, if I go on a jog, if I'm driving around running errands or whatever the case is, I typically have a podcast on and very often it is political or it is, um, you know, something to do with the news because that's how I'm kind of, you know, hearing different perspectives. And one thing that I try and always do is I try and listen to both sides. So I'll listen to a podcast that kind of sways to the right. And then I'll listen to a podcast that kind of sways a little to the left. And then I'll think to myself, all right, what are they saying? And, and what can I take out of both of those? Now, you know, unfortunately, a lot, most people don't have the time to do that. You know, I've kind of worked this into my schedule where it's almost part of my job, you know, what I do, because then I take that each week and I can talk about it on this show and I can, you know, use it, you know, talk with Chris and Shauna and our huddles about what's going on in the world. So we know how to position our business and strategize and things of that nature. So it's just an interesting thing I was thinking about, Shauna. Like, what are we going to talk about today? I haven't been watching the news because I was gone. Chris isn't here to talk, so I can pull things up real fast like I usually do. Because usually Chris, you know, can can talk about different subjects. And I'm in the background. You guys always see me, like, typing away and pulling things up. And as, Chris, as soon as Chris changes topics, you know, I have a new thing ready to go. So we're always ready to go. But since Chris wasn't here today, I was thinking to myself, you know, yesterday coming into this morning, like, what are we going to talk about? And I was just thinking, like, what is news at the end of the day? So... I don't know. Just a quick little rant I had. Just thought I'd share real fast, Shauna. I mean, what do you think? Well, honestly, it's funny that you bring that up. So I don't watch the news, but I had a little bit of like home construction going on and it lasted a little bit longer than I thought. So I was staying over at my aunt's house and she watches the news. And so I had, <clears throat> you know, as I'm walking around her house, it wasn't like I was sitting there watching it with her, but I'm walking around her house and, and she was watching Fox News. And it's pretty interesting though, because I have not watched the news in a long time. Uh, and it, it's just interesting when you're not paying attention and you do hear like, you, whether it is left or right, they really like lean into either side, like just far too much was my opinion. I was just like, what is this channel? And then I looked in the corner and it was like Fox News. And I'm not, even if you do watch, watch Fox News, I don't know, my, my whole opinion is, I grew up not in the corporate world in small businesses. I was always very, just like Chris, you know, me and Chris, I know all the troubles that he has with, with his businesses. I've always been like that since I was a little kid, like very close with my boss and seeing the reality of what it's like to be a small business owner through the decades, like through the last 20 years. And I also never really understood what networking was in a business aspect, but from a small town, um, it was nice to make connections in the community and know how to deal with life from your close environment. And then I do feel like the news, like the news that I've consumed had had in large part been like word of mouth. So it's really opinionated. And sometimes just like with a person you're talking to, you have to like, you have to like know like there's the truth and then there's like an opinion like layered on top of it and them trying to get somewhere get you to want to agree with them and so like that's just my take on it all is there's always a golden nugget like in the far left or the far right um but you just have to be aware of a lot of the overlaying stuff and just, I don't know, I use like my discernment to try to figure out the news. And I'm also happy to be a hypocrite too. Like I want, okay. I, I want my opinion to be one way. And then when I start to learn other things, like there's no harm in just, you know, being enlightened. So I don't know. That's my take. Oh, but then when I also started working for Chris, I was 29 and I, and at the same time, like I wasn't really paying attention to anything. Uh, you know, I wasn't, I only worked for small businesses, so I never had a retirement account. I never really had, you know, money that somebody else put into stocks. So I never really understood the stock market either. And then 
from somebody who doesn't understand the stock market, you think it's supposed to make sense. And then from working with Chris, I realized how it's, it's truly emotional and like, and, and based on human emotion, which is crazy to me like that, that was like the craziest understanding in the last like six or seven years was that it, like it stuff doesn't make sense. And like, we're trying to make sense of stuff in a world that doesn't make sense. So that's my take. I don't, I don't really, I don't really know. It's very yeah. emotional, very, yeah, yeah, I mean, very absolutely right. You're absolutely right. It's, you know, and, and we see it, you know, especially when it comes to politics, like how influential people really are, you know, especially young people. And when you look at statistics, you know, major universities, colleges lean very, very, very far on the Democratic side of the aisle when it comes to politics. And, you know, the old saying says I, I, something like if when you're young, if you're a uh, Republican, you have no heart. And when you're an adult, you're older. And you're a Democrat. You have, and you're, and you're a Democrat. You have no brain, or something <laughs> like that, right? And so, it, it's one of those things where it's like, you know, is it that when we're young, we're very influenced and we believe more, and so we we kind of just follow along with the herd and and listen to the mainstream, and that's what kind of sways us to that that side of the aisle, or you know, what is it that, that happens? And then as we get older, is it that we understand life more or is it that we just become smarter and realize that not everything is rose colored glasses as we get older? And so we start to open our eyes. I mean, I, I don't know, is it that we don't have time when we're young? Because, you know, uh, you know, when I was, I mean, just be very candid, um, you know, I was a, a Democrat and, and voted Democrat my entire I'll, life. I'll bring that up to, to you when you're back. Yeah, I mean, my, my entire life until, uh, I, I mean, I'll even say this, Donald Trump versus Hillary Clinton, I voted for Hillary, like, uh, up until then. And then, uh, yeah, I know, it's crazy. <laughs> and then about six months into the presidency, maybe a year into the presidency, um, I started to see how they attacked Donald Trump and 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 listen like coming from the entrepreneurial world and the real estate investment world i mean donald trump is the most famous real estate investor in new york state if not in the country in the last half century and so he's written so many books he partnered with robert kiyosaki uh, years ago who i've talked about as a big mentor of mine kiyosaki uh, you know rich dad poor dad series and so trump was always like this guy you know on tv with uh hey you're fired you know the, the tv show and you know a girl that i'm really good friends with was on season one of the apprentice and had nothing but great things to say about trump what an awesome guy he is how great he was like and she was a young girl at the time and, and just had nothing nothing but great things to say and that was a consensus until he ran for politics and beat the queen hillary clinton and then everybody hated him and I, I think and that was my turning point of you know when i started kind of paying a little more attention to politics because i saw that switch turn and it just didn't make any sense like, why would they completely turn against this? And then they start, you know, all the fascists and dictator. And then, you know, just just over this, you know, we'll talk more about recent news over the weekend. You know, he was talking about the economy and the automobile industry and all the cars being made in Mexico. And, he, he you know, he, he said, and I could play the video. It's only about a minute and a half long. You know, he, he said, you know, the, the economy, it's going to be a bloodbath if Biden wins this next election, which he's right. And, and what are the entire media apparatus do they've been coming out for the last week now claiming that trump said if biden wins there's going to be a bloodbath in this country like completely leaving the economic part out completely leaving the context out just saying that he's um you know wanting a civil war he's basically saying like if i don't win there's going to be blood in the streets and everyone's going to kill each other like that's how they're framing this comment that he made about the economy so and this has been going on now for seven eight years since you know trump said he was going to run against her and so when you start to realize like it's so dirty and it's just lies it's just i mean if you can't trust the mainstream media you can't trust the news anymore like, what are we doing as a society? And so it's such a broad issue. And so when I started, you know, so when I when I started paying attention to that back whenever that was, whenever Trump ran against Hillary, I started really paying attention to it because of that. 
it's just all the pieces started to falling into place. Like, Hey, there's an agenda here. Like they're driving this stuff. And it's just, it's just crazy to me to witness in real life, in real time. It just, I, I didn't think that that would be possible. And then all the facts that come out about how the social media companies all completely colluded with the government to push certain narratives and stories. Like, how is that possible? Like, who do we trust these days? And so I saw this, this video yesterday on X and it was talking about fake news. So this is a sitting congressperson, Ted Lieu. So just here, listen to his thoughts and you can tell me what you think about this, all right? The best way to oppose fake news is for people to watch outlets like MSNBC where you report real news all the time. All right, so this guy is a sitting congressperson and he's saying, okay, if you don't want fake news, listen to and watch MSNBC. Okay. Just stop for a minute. <laughs> Have you ever watched MSNBC? Anytime I've ever seen clips or flip that channel on, it's the most vile, propagandist, lying bullshit I've ever seen at a mass scale. MSNBC is the most pathetic news organization I've ever seen. Like I could pull up if I had time a thousand examples right now of them on MSNBC just straight lying. I mean, they were pushing over the weekend harder than anybody, this whole bloodbath thing. And so when we have a sitting congressperson that citizens of this country elected so they could trust him to give them the truth and to lead them and make policy decisions, telling you that if you want real news to watch NBC, like we're fucked. I, I don't know how else to say it. And so it's just crazy to me. Like, I don't know, Sean, what, what you think about that? Well, a couple things. So Lynn put like, it's interesting that I think Fox News is far right. I also want to point out, I wasn't really watching it. And I was just listening when they were bashing Joe Biden on news, which honestly, I've never, I don't watch the news, but I only hear it being bashed here on the internet. So I, I took that as, that was kind of like my my uh, thought of like, damn, finally somebody is like saying something on a like a national level. So that's kind of just where I ca came from that. And again, I don't know, it's whatever. But um, I do feel like all everything is just like imposed on us. So it also depends on like, how open we are to somebody else's opinion like when you mentioned being or voting democrat when you were younger like i the way that i got registered to vote was like i was at my boyfriend's house and some lady knocked on the door and we were you know we were seniors in high school and she had a clipboard and she registered us to vote and i didn't know what i was and she's like well new york's a democratic state so and i was like okay so i'm a registered democrat you know what i mean but like i made that decision uneducated and right. off the like off the spot and it was like super weird and like i i i'm sure that i'm not alone in the way that you become indoctrinated into freaking politics in this country so like um i don't know but yeah i i hear you. it's it's so true i mean in high school my, my senior year i grew up in for you know i went to middle school high school in Southwest Virginia. So about four hours from Washington, DC in a little town called Christiansburg, Virginia, which is in the New River Valley near Virginia Tech, Blacksburg, about 45 minutes from the West Virginia border, but a little over an hour from the Tennessee border. And we went on our, our, our um, senior trip to George Bush's um, uh, inauguration. He was just elected president in 2000. And his inauguration was in January, uh, end of January in 2001. And I had just turned 18 years old in 2000, uh, five, a week before, on, on January 15th. Um, so I, I didn't vote in the in the in that election because I was still 17 years old. But we went on our senior trip there, and I, I didn't even know who George Bush was. Like you know, when you're in high school, you don't know politics. At least back then, we didn't. And where I grew up. And so I remember going to this election, it was like a big deal. And, you know, it, I, my friends, we didn't even watch it. Like we went, we went and kind of snuck away and did our own thing. Like during the inauguration, we're like, we're here to like, whatever, have fun. But then, you know, it just, you know, but you just listen, you know, when you think back to being younger, like, like you're saying, and like, you don't know, you just kind of do what your friends do and do what other people do and what you're kind of told to do and things like that. And so it's just, it's just, it's a wild conversation to me, you know, at well, the end of the day. 
And what's crazy though is like I'm technically a registered Democrat, but I've I've voted Republican in my entire existence. And Trump was oh, the really? first president that I ever voted for that actually won. So that was cool. <laughs> yeah, you should change your registration. Um I kind of like it. I kind of like the statistic <laughs> of being a Democrat but voting Republican. You know what I mean? Like, I hope that that like says something. You're messing with our statistics. There, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and, and and when said, you know, interesting what you think. Fox is far right. We watch like the five outnumbered, and they have people on both sides. And, and you're right, Lynn. And and it, you know, saying far right is, is kind of weird. You know, far left because when you really and my real opinion is. I haven't really changed much of what I believe in, what my thoughts Same. are on politics. To me, over the last decade, where the Democrat side of the aisle, the left, whatever you want to call it, I don't feel like I've moved much where I might have been kind of in the middle, leaning left. But I feel like that now today, like the far, like it's become wacko stuff, like the whole transing the kids um, you know, like abortion up until the day of birth, like go back and watch Hillary Clinton, Bill, Bill Clinton, um, Joe Biden, watch all these Democrats just 10 years ago talking about how they believe, you know, abortion should be rare and, and for exceptions and, 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 you know, things like that or whatever that saying was. And it's just been very recently where they're like, ah, no matter what we're going to, and then the whole trans thing, just bizarre. Like it's always been like the privacy of your home, do what you want, freedom. Now it's like, no, we need these 12 year olds to cut off their breasts and take this <laughs> irreversible uh, pills that are going to change their makeup and testosterone and, and turn yeah. these girls into boys and boys into girls. And, and now these men can compete against women and things like swimming and wrestling and like what the hell happened? Like that happened quick too. And, 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 and just more, even more recently, all the anti-Semitism on the, on the democratic side of the aisle. Like I never thought in my lifetime, I would see the way that Jewish people are being treated in this country done by a major political party. Like Joe Biden is not stepping up for them at all. And it's just, it's bizarre. He did it at the very beginning, he started losing some votes from like the Michigan people and stuff like that. It's like, what happened? So I truly believe it's it's more of a outside influence that's kind of pushing and driving a lot of this. And a lot of us have stayed the same, but these major political parties in this country have really ran far one way or the other. And I don't see it as much on the Republican side of the aisle. I mean, I feel like Republicans have always had their things, um, uh, you know, and they, they, they haven't really gone off the edge like I've seen it happen on the Democrat side of the aisle. It's almost like Republicans kind of just held their own, stayed where they are. They haven't done too much that's gone, you know, crazier than where they've been for the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And so that seems to make more sense. And at the end of the day, though, regardless of the sides, like I truly believe we do need a third party in this country, like a viable um, a third party that would actually, you know, be competitive. Um, I think that would maybe solve a lot of issues. And I think people are craving that. I think they want that more of a middle zone, not the far left, not the far right. They want more of that middle. And I don't, I don't know how else we're going to get back to that other than some kind of third party coming about. Because when you look at the Senate, you look at the House, I mean, they almost always vote directly down party lines. It's very rarely we see a truly bipartisan bill or arrangement come out. And so to me, it just looks like we're, we're almost too far gone. We're too to, to, to come back and have any middle ground, you know, and, and we'll see where that leads to. But that's just kind of my opinion on that. I think I actually think we are probably as a whole more in the middle, but we feel forced to pick a side. You know what I mean? Like you yeah. have to kind of side and that's, that's unfortunate. And then also, I don't know if the crazy ass opinions are due to like, I don't know if you ever go out in public sometimes, but like there's the people, the general population is freaking weird. Like I had to go to the mall. I had to go to the mall to get a new Apple charger for my laptop. Cause it broke. And you know, some like just, you got to keep your chin up and look around and like there's a lot of weird people out there so maybe like that's the type of people that get unfortunately influenced by that radical side i don't know well no, you're you're I'm absolutely afraid. right it's almost like we've you know made mental illness okay which 
I'm not saying we need to lock mentally ill people up in like a scene <laughs> by any means. I mean, well, if we do, I don't like know. It happened back in the 60s, the 50s, 60s, whenever all that happened. But it's like we also have gone, again, the pendulum swings, right? And I, I honestly believe that, that we do see these and we are swinging back right now to some sane reality. It's just happening kind of slowly in my opinion. But, you know, as we swing back and forth, but like, yeah, right now with mentally ill, mental illness is 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 way up right now and it's, it seems to be championed and promoted almost and i don't know how else to look at it and so that's a big problem a hundred percent well okay you know how you brought up civil war i i go to like I, I started to think about it like i like literally can't imagine a civil war and and if like in 10 15 years like i just feel like they're melting everybody's fucking brain and then in 10 15 years like the, the people who could fight in a civil war are going to be shriveled up and old. So like, like I feel like where the people are going cannot fend for themselves in that situation. So I almost can't even believe it. Like, I don't know. Yes. Yeah, so I don't think we're ready. People are, ready I just don't see it too war. soft. People are too soft to block. Yeah. A hundred percent. And it's, you know, and then, it, you know, and you kind of put the tinfoil hat on, you start thinking to yourself, well, it's not even tinfoil hat because it's, it's, it's history and it's happened before. It'll definitely happen again. But what if a, a, a meteor did hit the, the world and caused a, a blackout where there's no sun, sunlight? Um, what if the electrical grid goes down because of a solar flare and we have no power for six months or a year? I mean, the devastation, you know, people, you know, I, I've read statistics put out by official um, bureaus. And it says within like six six months to a year, over 90% of the population would be dead if we lost a, a power, if we lost the electrical grid. And it's scary because this is stuff that's happened. You know, it's been billions of years, but it happens every so many billions of years. And so, well, you know, what's to say that couldn't happen again? So then you start thinking to yourself, you know, politics, civil war, like all this internal stuff we're doing is almost meaningless to the actual universe. And so that's what kind of drives me crazy too about the whole climate, man-made climate change. Like, of course the climate changes, of course we're contributing to it, but how much is it is worth completely changing our life? And I'm not going to get into climate change right now, but it's just one of those topics that people seem to get on one side or the other and they want to fight for it. But in the grand scheme reality of things, like, is it really that big of a deal or is it more like a little microscopic piece of sand in the greater scheme of things? And, and so people seem to focus because it is a topic that they can get on and, and they can get on a certain team and and things like that. And so it's, it's I don't know, it's, a, it's, a, it's another weird one to me. Um, over here in the comments, you know, Drew had said the answer is for everyone to watch Joe Rogan, <laughs> which I, I like the comment um, because... I like what Joe Rogan does. You know, he, and I, I listen to Joe Rogan occasionally. I'll listen to maybe one of, if he has somebody on that I like or that I also follow, I'll listen. So maybe one out of every four or five episodes or something, I'll typically listen through. They're very long. They're three hours long. Um, I know, I've only watched a few because they're so long. Yeah, they are. But that's the part I like about Joe Rogan is he does have those long conversations. And that's what it takes. That's why the news will never be enough because it's, crammed into a little spot when they say something it's this big you do need to spend if you care if you want to know about a topic you need to hear a discussion and a discussion and questions and answers for three hours to make up your mind yeah no absolutely and, that, and that's the thing like you know the news has these little 30 second sound bites and and then you know the broader conversation they'll take and they'll break it up and they'll put out little not context just like the bloodbath comment and so that happens all the time but the cool part with rogan and what he's doing is he's having these long form conversations um and people want that you know they're tired of listening to the sound bites and, and these idiots on television these talking idiots talking heads telling them what to think like people want to think on their own you know and so having these long form conversations three plus hours you can really dive into a lot of topics you can hear opinions you can break it down you can really get in depth about a lot of this stuff and then he brings on experts people that are smarter than he is and he lets them talk and he'll even bring on people from different sides of the aisle to kind of talk it out and, and, and arrange that and facilitate that kind of thing. So, uh, you know, I, I, I love that. And, and we definitely, I think that's the future. And I think that we'll have more and more of that um, moving forward, which is a good thing. 
So I'm just reading down through some of the comments. Um, yeah. You know, the satire said 2007 when I started following Ron Paul, which I, I do like, you know, Ron and his son, Rand Paul. I, I do think they are good for the country. I think they have the, the heart of the country. Um, you know, they would, you know, Rand Paul, I think, would make an excellent third party independent type um, candidate. But again, there's just no traction behind it. It's 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 tough. So uh, he couldn't run. A, he has regional groups and he had to run under Republican. Yeah, because when you have that that middle ground, yeah, I guess even back then, satire, you know, that middle ground, um, the major political parties don't want that. They want somebody that's going to kind of push. And that's why nobody really liked Trump from either side of the aisle back then, because he was that wild card. Trump would come out and say whatever he wanted to say. And I, I mean, Trump, another guy, Trump was a lifelong Democrat. <laughs> you know, he, he voted Democrats his whole life until he realized, hey, there's an issue here. I got to run Republican. That's what I'm saying. It is, in my opinion, I mean, there's a time and a place to be a, a healthy hypocrite, to change your mind. Like, God, I, please, God, change my mind sometimes. I don't want to die on some hill <laughs> forever. Yeah. Uh, just kind of reading through the comments. Well, Lynn, Lynn brought up one, too. Yeah, I mean, a Trump and... and um, I'm uh, hoping for that, too. I, right? I am really interested to see who Trump's going to pick. I think he came out over the weekend and said he's not going to pick uh, Vivek. Uh, Ram Swamy, but he might have another position for him within the administration. Um, a lot of people were thinking maybe he would go that route. Uh, so I am interested to see what what Trump decides to do as far as that goes. And I mean, it's just it, it's it is wild to see what they're doing to him in New York right now, though, Shauna. Like I, I don't, you guys got to get out of that state. It's just just out of pure principle, you need to get out of that state. I mean, I was watching on Twitter. I, I could pull it up, but this here. lady, this lady owns a home in Queens. It had squatters there. And she went to get the squatters out and guess who the police arrested? They arrested her, the homeowner. The, the squatters haven't paid her any money. There's no contract. There's no lease agreement. There's nothing. But because they had been squatting there unbeknownst to her for 30 plus days, they have like legal status and it could take over two years for her to legally evict these people. So she went there, like get out of my house. The police came and literally put the owner of the home in handcuffs and arrested her. Like this just happened over the weekend, which is mind blowing to me. I mean, Letitia James, what a piece of shit woman that is. And the judge on the case that convicted Trump. I mean, Shauna, we've been in real estate. I know you've, you've worked with Chris for a long time. You guys have gotten hundreds of loans over the years, um, business loans, real estate loans, mortgages. I've done the same thing. So I understand how this works. You go to the bank, you ask them for a loan, you tell them what your collateral is. They take that information. They do their due diligence. They, um, you know, appraise the property. They figure out what the value is. They figure out what they're going to loan you. You agree upon the terms of that loan. You guys both sign the agreement. Everything gets paid back to the bank. Case closed, done, transaction completed. We move on to the next one. Everybody's happy. Okay. Well, what they did to, Donald Trump in New York state was they went back and said, Hey, these loans that you took from these banks, even though the banks agreed to them, even though you paid the banks back, nobody lost money. Nobody broke a contract, anything like that, because you said the your real estate was worth more than what it actually was. According to us, the state, Remember, the bank agreed the real estate was worth that. The bank appraised it themselves. The bank put it in contract form and agreed. Doesn't matter. The state of New York said, we believe that the real estate was not worth that. Even though you paid the banks back, there was no financial hurt, anything, no harm caused anywhere in any of this. We, New York State, are going to fine you, essentially, because the lawsuit is for 450 some million dollars. So they are telling... Donald Trump, he needs to pay the state of, not the banks, not anybody that got harmed because nobody got harmed. They have to pay the state of New York over $450 million because the state of New York said the real estate wasn't worth that when the banks agreed to it. What in the fuck? Is that the name of this podcast? What the fuck happened? Like, what the hell is going on? Like, like this, you over This literally that. happened. And now he's trying to, he can't get a bond to appeal. You can't appeal it until you have enough bond money up for the appeal. Nobody will give him a bond because it's so much money. It's unheard of ever. And it's all in an attempt politically to bankrupt him from being able to run for president. The amount of corruption 
that it well, takes. Think, that I think for Trump happen. having so independent wealth like, is happening, like maybe gonna happen. This is this happened. Like this is done. Like he owes this money. Like it could bankrupt him. That is unfathomable to me. Like you got to get out of New York. It makes no sense. New York is pretty awful, and it well, it, I don't know. It sucks. I live in more of like a, a smaller town where. You can rely on people, but it, it, the state as a whole, it, it's such crap. But good thing for Trump, though, is like what what's it called? It, independent independent wealth is apparently not a, a prerequisite to becoming the, the president of the, or running for, for office. You don't have to have your own wealth. So I guess maybe we'll have a bankrupt uh, president. That'd be cool. Yeah, I mean, you know. Biden has a lot of money tucked away for this campaign. Now he can't go out and actually campaign, but they'll use it on media and the news and everything else. And so it's going to be dirty. I mean, it's just, it, it's just what's going on right now in this country is it, it's, it's bad. It's not good. It's not going to end well. It's, it's, it's something's got to happen. That's all I'm going to say. Something's got to change. Mike, Mike is saying California is charging residents who want to leave the state with new exit tax. That's also so freaking weird that that's it's unconstitutional i, I think it's it'll be so weird. um yeah i mean it's 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 bizarre and there's a lot of business people a lot of very wealthy people that left the state um on a time crunch you know just before you know they they also instituted this new uh, uh what do they call it wealth tax for for um homes that are sold over a certain value and yeah for like the millionaire like yeah, yeah right before that one mansion was, tax like, all these people were selling these big properties for just to offload them before that tax. Like it in the, at the end of the day, none of that does any good for anybody. And so, you know, it's the pendulum, the pendulum though, you know, California has been so far out there for so many years, New York starting to get out there so far. I can only imagine that at some point it's going to have to start to come back. I mean, San Francisco, thank God I had the opportunity to travel out there um, 10, 15 years ago, multiple times and see the city for what it was when it was beautiful. I mean, I wish I was out there in the sixties during the, the, the height of the hippie age and all that, you know, that looked really cool in San Francisco, but I was out there 10, 15 years ago, a bunch of times, beautiful city. One of the most beautiful cities, great times I've ever had in my life in this country. And I won't go there now. I know a lot of people that won't go there now. It's become dangerous. It's just, it's, it's bizarre. Everybody that's left, all the businesses that are left, the people that live there, like they can't even go outside anymore. Like it's crazy what's going on in San Francisco. So we're starting to see some of that come back, which is not fast enough though. That's crazy. My, my, my best friend actually, so they're in the, they're in the military and they actually just moved to Dublin, California, which is like 45 minutes from San Francisco. And they're there for the night until 2026. So. Good luck to them. Fingers crossed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we flew into Sacramento um, to drive out to Lake Tahoe last week. So I was out in California and we had a friend that came to visit us that lives in Sacramento, you know, she, and, and she's, very, very, you know, far left too, living out there now for a decade and stuff. And, but even she was like, you know, it, it, it's some of the stuff that's going on. Like, I don't fully agree with things like that, but it's just, it, it's definitely an interesting topic. So, all right. So I, I did want to get into a little bit about the federal reserve. Um, I didn't know, I didn't know what we were going to talk about for an hour. Sean, I just looked up and we got like 10 minutes left. So I don't know. No, okay, sorry. <laughs> I don't know how that happened so quickly, but um, let me pull up this, this article. Uh, today's a pretty big day when it comes to finance. Make sure my, there we go. Make sure I'm in, in focus here. So I'm just going to pull up this article and read through it because this is kind of the news of the day, so to say, uh, with the Federal Reserve and Jerome Powell coming out. Um, so everything to expect from the Federal Reserve's policy meeting today, Wednesday, March 20th, 2024. So, of course, um, Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell. So the Federal Reserve has a lot to do at its meeting this week, but ultimately may not end up doing a whole lot in terms of changing the outlook for monetary policy. So just to go back to the end of last year into the beginning of this year, all the talk has been about how the Federal Reserve is going to start cutting rates again, and that's going to boom the economy, you know, boom the markets. It's going to drop um, interest rates, mortgage rates, and it's going to get everything going again. So that's kind of been what the, the, the leading indicator, what the talk has been about. 
And it looks like they've slowly over the past several meetings now have kind of been walking that back. And it looks like that's where we're at right now. So let's get into this. In addition to releasing its rate decision after the meeting wraps up Wednesday, the central bank will update its economic projections as well as its unofficial forecast for the direction of interest rates over the next several years. As expectations have swung sharply this year for where the Fed is headed, this week's two-day session of the Federal Open Market Committee will draw careful scrutiny for any clues about the direction of interest rates. Yet the general feeling is that policymakers will stick to their recent messaging, which has emphasized the patient data-driven approach with no hurry to cut rates until there's greater visibility on inflation. So inflation, we've talked a lot about it on the show over the last couple of years. Um, two years ago, inflation was at double digits. Remember, the goal for the Federal Reserve is to have 2% annual inflation, um, meaning your dollar is going to devalue 2% a year. That's just kind of what their goal is. That's what they feel is the best for the markets to keep the economy growing, to keep things going, stuff like that, 2%. So remember a couple of years ago, we were at double digits. We hit almost at 10% um, inflation. It slowly came down a little bit. Uh, right now, I think we're around like three and a half percent, three, three and a half percent. So we're still about 50 to 100% above the, the target market goal, but much lower than where we were at 10%. Now, when we look at over the last two years, you know, we're looking at about 17, 18, 19% inflation, depending on, um, you know, which numbers you look at. And what that means is that's what we feel as people when we go shopping, when we go out, you know, to buy things, we're feeling that increase of almost 20% that's just crazy. over the last two years. And that's why a lot of people right now are saying, you know, I'm living paycheck to paycheck. I'm putting more and more on credit cards. And that's why we see a lot of these statistics coming out. Car repos are going up. Foreclosures starting to creep back up. Um, you know, people are running out of money because it costs more to live. Um, and, and people are getting multiple jobs, two and three jobs, and still aren't able to pay. A lot of that is driven because of inflation. So that's why a lot of this is very important. Um, so they'll make it clear that they're obviously not ready to cut rates, even though they said last year they were planning on cutting rates all this year. Um, so, you know, they've kind of walked that back now. They need a few more data points to feel confident that inflation is heading back to target and they're not seeing it. I expect them to reaffirm three uh, rate cuts this year. So that would suggest the first rate cut would be in June. I think that's wishful thinking. Um, now, one thing that is driving this is we do, of course, have a presidential election in November at the end of this year. And so some people are saying, you know, hey, they might drive rates down to um, to kind of light a little fire in the economy, to get things booming again before the election, uh, to make it feel like everything's OK. We'll see what happens with that. So there's multiple different factors. There's the numbers, there's the Fed, there's election season. All this kind of drives into all this, even though it's not supposed to. Let's face reality. It does. Uh, markets have had to adjust to the Fed's approach on the fly, scaling back both the timing and frequency of expected cuts this year. Earlier this year, traders in the Fed funds futures market were anticipating the rate cutting campaign to kick off in March and continue until the FOMNC um, had cut the equivalent of six or seven times in increments of quarter percentage points. Uh, now the market has pushed out the timing until at least June with only three cut rates uh, anticipated. And the uh, current target range from 5.25 to 5.5. Uh, remember, just before COVID, we were at like 1%, 2%, dropped down to zero, essentially, the overnight rate. And now we're at about 5.5. And, and this is what drives interest rates for mortgages, for credit cards, for car notes, for everything you would get loans on from a bank. Um, this rate drives what those rates are. So the swing in expectations will make how the central bank delivers its message this week all the more important. So what all these financial institutions, all these institutional traders, um, they really pay attention to what the central banks are doing, because depending on where rates are, that's what kind of drives the economy. Um, and then what the Fed does is they use this thing called the dot plot. So let me just go through this real fast, because the dot plot is interesting to understand. So though the quarterly plot of individual members expectations is pretty arcane this meeting likely will all uh, will be all about the dots specifically investors will look at how the 19 fomc members both voters and non-voters will indicate their expectation for rates through the end of the year and out to 2026 and beyond 
When the matrix was last updated in December, the dots pointed to three cuts in 2024, four in 2025, three more in 2026, and then two more at some point to take the long range federal funds rate down to around two and a half percent, which the Fed considers neutral, neither promoting nor restricting growth. Doing the math, it would only take two FOMC members to get more hawkish to reduce the rate cuts this year to two. That, however, is not the general expectation. It only takes two individual dots moving higher to raise the 2024 median. Three dots are not uh, three dots are enough to push the long run dot 25 basis point higher. City grew to comment said. Um, yada, yada. The rate call for March more immediately. The FOMC will conduct a largely academic vote on what to do with rates now. So we'll be looking out um, today to kind of see what they come out with, what they say rates are going to be today uh, moving forward and what that long term projection and outlook looks like. So make sure you guys are following us on Facebook and I'll post some stuff about that later today. And I'm sure when Chris gets back from New Zealand, he'll do some videos for YouTube uh, talking about what's going on with the Federal Reserve, with these projections and what that outlook looks like. Uh, so just a quick uh, update on that, Shauna. Any comments coming in? Um, just a few um, <clears throat> like different ones. So Lynn brought up, which I, I like I looked up while you were looking that up, but Newsom is starting to charge electricity on how much you make, not how much you use, which is freaking crazy. I looked it up and it's like if you make it, it sucks that this country incentivizes people to be poor. Like it yeah. really like I um I had benefited, like I, I, my family didn't have a lot of money. And like, honestly, like when I was younger, we had the, the like state given insurance and like, it's great. It, it you get, it's great to be poor. It is so messed up. It is so weird. Um, but I guess if you make between 28,000 and 69,000, you could pay 20 to $34 per month for electricity. And if you make 180,000, you'd pay 85 to $128. <laughs> for electricity so it's like again i don't know it's like it's beating you you want to grow as a person i feel like you always want to increase your income but they really are just like making it harder and harder like we see that with the taxes and everything too it's it's i mean i hate to say it but it's literally the entire democratic platform at this point i mean watch anything biden says uh, from now until he, it's 100 percent Donald Trump is evil and is going to end the world if he's elected again, which bizarre, but okay. I mean, that's their pitch. Like literally Donald Trump is bad. That's the entire pitch that. And one other thing, which is giving shit away for free. Um, so we see it in student loans. We see them coming out right now. That's not going to happen. Like, giving like, people to buy uh, money to buy homes, um, reduce rates, uh, you know, all these extra incentives for poor people. Like, 100%. Those are his two things that he talks about. There's nothing else. I mean, there's nothing else he can talk about. Everything else is shit right now. The open borders. I mean, I didn't even get to get into this. I don't know if Chris is going to be back next Wednesday. I know we'll be over in Tampa, I think, but we'll figure it out. But oh, we got to do an episode just on the illegal immigration and the open borders right now because it is also destroying this country right now. It's crazy. I mean, just me personally, a personal antidote I'm seeing. You know, I live in South Florida. Um, pretty close to Haiti. Uh, Haiti's very, very close. And Haiti's gone over the last week or two is going through a terrible, true civil war. Um, the leader of Haiti, I don't know, he's not the, I think he's called the prime minister, um, fled the country a week or two ago. Yeah. Um, these gangs have taken over, taken control. Um, you know, there's reports of cannibalism and, and all this awful stuff going on over there. You know, Haiti's uh, historically been a very poor country and, and, and very sad, really. I mean, just because I do live in South Florida, there's a lot of Haitians here. And so I see it firsthand. Um, but right now I've never seen more state troopers patrolling our local roads and pulling over trucks, um, box trucks mm -hmm. over the last week. And I don't know this for sure, 
but I'm pretty sure it's because of what's going on with Haiti and everybody that's coming over right now and trying to get here uh, because of what's going on over there. I think they're just trying to control it. It's pretty wild to see firsthand. So I can't imagine what these people in Texas and Arizona and these border states are going through. And you see cool. some of it on, on, on social media and stuff. And so we got to do a whole episode of just on that because it's wild. And why? The why behind um, the Democrat Biden push for open borders and letting these people in. I mean, it's... It gets really, really, really sketchy. So so my best friend who just moved to basically San Francisco area now, they were just in uh, El Paso, Texas, and I went to visit her there. And you can literally see the, the border there is a chain link fence. So you can look right over uh, t- to Mexico there. And, you know, she was telling me at the time, what was nice is they lived on a on a, the army base. So, you know, at least their actual neighborhood is in like a compound basically. But, you know, it may my one thing about just immigrants in general is uh or illegal ones i should say is i do feel horrible for them like you don't know what they're going through or what they've been told on the other side like just just like thinking in your mind if somebody's in mexico and then somebody tells them give me your whole life savings i get you over to america and it's amazing and they get over to freaking el paso texas and they're just stuck on the street you know what i mean like living like crazily so just from a human aspect it sucks but um i wish that they had the proper like i wish that they had the real like the realistic expectation of what it means when you get over here <laughs> like it's you're, you're it's not it's not going to solve your problems it's just a whole bunch of new ones yeah it's, it's, there's a lot that goes into that conversation for sure so we will have to take more time right. on it but i know we're at the top of the hour so that that did go by fast we might have to that was a lot of fun sean thanks for coming on we might have to yeah. or kick chris out of here more often and and, and 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 you and I can take the show over occasionally, but um, appreciate everybody for being on. Any any last words? Actually, yeah. So so similar to how I was saying, I grew up in a small town, and and without knowing it, I networked with the people in the area just by being a waitress. Like so, I was able to, you know, when I when I hit a deer, someone could come and take care of it, right? And they would bury my deductible. And you kind of make these connections where. When something happens to you, you know who to call, you know who to trust, and you know that they trust you. And so I, I just wanted to, to point out too, just like Private Money Club and how even living in New York State, you know, I, I still am able to have that great community of my actual neighbors that take care of me, uh, whether the state itself sucks ass. And so also just the the world and being a part of Private Money Club. Um, I think I, I cling to that so much because I do feel like the, I mean, I say, I forget who said it was, it was either Noah Harris or Kevin Shortell said it first, but like the crazier it is out there, the better it is in here. And even being on the inside, I do have to hear that and hear that and hear that because like you mentioned in the beginning, Stephen, like, I don't know if it's human nature or the path most traversed is that negative mindset. So even with knowing I'm secure, having you guys on my team, being a part of something bigger, the, the, the negativity can creep in and the fear and and like the what ifs do. And so I just want to constantly keep reminding people like the power of coming back to stay tapped in with us, not just us as like watching on the screen, but get involved in the community. I love to see you guys chatting back and forth with each other and in the chats. And, you know, it's like that on the webinars. It's like that in the Facebook groups. And um, it's just everything to me is like this community, private money club, money school, everything. So happy to be here with you guys today. So thanks. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, Shauna. So we'll be back at one o'clock Eastern for Wealth Webinar Wednesday. Uh, today, I think we're going to get into a little bit about infinite banking and, and actually I want to get into a little bit of private money club, Shauna. So That's we'll it. be back at one o'clock. So if you haven't registered for that show, you go to chrisnoggle.com. Uh, just look for the big banner, Wealth Webinar Wednesday. It's a free webinar. Register for it. It's through Zoom. Uh, you'll also get three of our um, best books, uh, digital versions, Mapping Out the Millionaire Mystery, um, How to Get All the Money Back for Every Car You'll Ever Buy, Drive, and Own, and the Private Money Guide Real Estate Edition. So we'll give you those three free ebooks just for registering. Join us at 1 p.m. Eastern to learn more. And then we'll be right back here on social media and YouTube at 4.30 p.m. Eastern today 
for Ask Me Anything with the rest of our team uh, just to answer all of your questions. So thanks, everybody, for being here this morning. We appreciate you guys, and uh, we will see you later today. Thanks, Shauna.